I wanted to share this with you, especially the younger members of our audience, because I realized I gave up about a year and a half of my life to reach a dream of writing this book. And tonight is my first opportunity to be able to share why I wrote it and why this was the perfect time for it. Now, originally, I wanted to entitle this presentation Alien Worlds, because that's what it's about. And then I realized it probably should be entitled The Amazing Journey. Everybody, how many of you out there have thought about writing a book? How many of you have done it? Well, for those of you that have, you know it's a long process. It's a long journey. And when you finally get to the end sometimes, you really can't believe you spent all that time doing it. And writing a book of something of, of this nature, I never realized how long it was going to take. I wrote Space Encyclopedia, and by the way, Christine Pulliam helped with one of the chapters and some of the writing. And I wrote this because I wanted something that you could sit down in just a few moments and start from beginning to end and understand the universe. For those of you that didn't have six weeks to, to read a book and take it back to the library, you can do this in four enjoyable days. It takes you from start to finish about everything, the latest information we know about the universe. I wanted to show you what an eclipse of the sun would look like from the moon. I wanted to be able to show you what gamma ray bursts, the most energetic explosions in the universe, would look like if you were in a spaceship looking right out the window. I wanted to show you some of the new planets that we've discovered around other stars out there. I wanted to show you what Ceres would look like if we could fly through the asteroid belt. I wanted to show you what Mars will look like when some of the younger members in this room go there for vacation or do some of their scientific work on the surface of Mars. So consequently, this was a book that really brought you up to speed on the universe. It, it brought out some of the most interesting questions that we have about the universe. There is a door one of these days that is going to open up in our knowledge of the universe, and it's going to tell us why, when we look at the universe, we only see this 4% of it. Every star, every galaxy, every planet, every dust cloud, all is contained in this 4%. The other 96% of our universe is unknown to us. It's a mystery. And someday we'll begin to understand what the other part to our universe is. All of this is covered in that book. But this one, this one, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I loved it. Sometimes I hated it. <laughs> because how do you create alien life on worlds that you don't know if it exists or not, or what it would look like. This was a challenge. And like many of you out there in school today, you are going to be challenged. Your teachers are going to give you projects to do, things for you to come up with, and that is the beauty of it. I never left school. And to me, this was like the biggest school project I ever had to do. And I had to study for it. We think sometimes adults are so smart. Well. They may be smart enough to know what they don't know and where to go find that information. And so that's what I had to do when I began this book. Now, I'll be honest with you. I love aliens. Anybody else in here love aliens? Raise your hand. Any of you ever seen an alien? Any of you suspect your brother and sister may be one? That's what I thought. So let's see how good you are. Who's the alien on the left? What movie was it in? Alien, good. The one on the right? Predator, you're doing well. Now it gets a little bit tougher. Who's the alien in blue? Spock, good. What type of alien is he? A what? A Vulcan. I heard Romulan out there. It's a Vulcan. Romulans have the little things on their nose. Okay, who's the big guy in the middle? His name is Gort. And if you ever see him, you need to know these three words. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. Say it. Klaatu, Barada, Nikto. It's the only thing that will stop him. Okay. Who's the one next to him? What movie did that come from? Oh, a classic. This Island Earth. 
So as you can tell, I love science fiction movies. In fact, what I love the most is my parents would throw me in the back of the car with my pajamas on and a pillow and a blanket, and they would go to the drive-in movies. And when we went to the drive-in movies, we would watch an alien picture. See, he was texting and not paying attention. He missed his ride. Don't do it. Stay in that car. Here it comes. <sighs> we told him to stay in the car. Did he listen? Well, I even like science fiction films today, and especially the ones that have aliens in them. I must say, one of my favorite of all alien movies is not E.T. It is not Men in Black, although it is kind of funny. Paul is my favorite alien. Hey, Bruce, wait up. You don't smoke. I just wanted to say thanks. I know this has been weird for you, but you saved my life and I owe you one, okay? Okay. What do you got there, by the way? Severe epirental memory complicated by macular edema in your left vitreous cavity? How did you know that? Lucky guess. Do you mind if I take a look at it for one second? What does it say in the Old Testament? An eye for an eye? Wait, I don't... It's okay. You can trust me. I don't know. I... Just have a little faith, okay? That's Paul. <laughs> He's got a wise mouth. He's... But that's Paul from another planet. And that is the type of alien most of us think we'll meet when we get in space. And the truth of the matter is, it more than likely isn't. Aliens won't think, act, or look anything like that. One of the things I had to do was reteach myself about the things that were important to me because not only do I write the books, I illustrate them. And I illustrate them on a Mac using Photoshop. I literally spray paint onto the screen for the paintings that I create and I like to make them look real. I also make models and photograph them and put them into the scenes. But before I could do this, this was a small stack of all the books I read. I read in a year and a half over 50 books. And look at the variety. What a Plant Knows by Daniel Chamovitz, who will be here. I wrote, I read all about plants. Bird Sense by Tim Birkeland. What do birds know that are so different that you and I would never know it when we watched them out across our lawn? Radical evolution. What is going to happen in the future as humans start controlling evolution on Earth? The Book of Life by J Stephen Jay Gould. The Science of Art. How in, in art, as a scientist, can you present images that people can understand? 
Diane Ackerman, The History of the Senses, is one of the most beautiful books written about our five senses with things that you would never imagine. I went to Maxfield Parrish. I wanted to see how he painted the colors, the dimensions, because I wanted my worlds to look like him. I looked at the Hudson Valley painters who did those beautiful, beautiful paintings at the turn of the century of America and the Grand Canyon and the plains and the valleys and the rivers and the oceans. I wanted to capture that in my artwork. Work. I read The Future of Life on Earth by Ed Wilson, Life on Earth by David Attenborough, The Life of Super Earths by Dimitar Sasloff, one of our professors here and leading planet finders at the Center for Astrophysics, and How to Find Habitable Planets by James Casting, one of the experts on planetary research. So this is what I had to do. I had to read and read and read and take notes to be able to create what I wanted to create. How do you do an alien? I don't know. But I looked for the first time at everything that was around me. I was in Vermont in the middle of winter, and I go into a grocery store, and I'm walking out, and there is this ugly little plant growing there. And I said, that's the creepiest alien-looking thing I've ever seen. So I bought it and brought it home. <laughs> I would go to museums and look at their museum displays of ancient life on Earth. I would take a walk and wonder, what am I going to do about this alien? And there would be this uh, piece of material hanging off of a tree, a fungi, a fungi. And I would pull it off and take it home and stick it in my garden. But looking at it, I said, boy, that looks alien to me. Sitting on my patio one Saturday afternoon, here comes a slug crawling right across the patio. I went and photographed it. And yes, there is a creature in my book that this was taken from, but it's not like the slug in your garden. I was in the jungles of Guatemala when I saw this incredible pod, and I pulled it off and photographed it because I knew that it might be a piece or a part of an alien creature I wanted to put together. I looked under microscopes. I even saw this. It's a whale vertebra in a neighbor's front yard as a statue. I used that in one of my images. Later, I removed it. But these were all inspirations of what I'm saying to you. Keep your eyes open because inspiration is everywhere around you. You just have to tune your brain to be looking for it. Oh, it got bad. Flowers that popped up out of my garden. I was on my hands and knees photographing. I went into a, a, a shop of antiques in Monterey and I saw this lamp and I had to just photograph it because I knew somehow that lamp would show up. We went out and even the tomato sitting in my windowsill to ripen, it's in the book, but you would never know it was a tomato. It's there. <laughs> Insects, they would land on the post and I'd use the telephoto lens to photograph them. My son sent me pictures back of the sand spiders in Afghanistan that all the soldiers see. I knew something creepy had to look like them. And even to the embarrassment of one of my dear friends, David Kingsley, in Colorado, we went out to dinner at a Japanese restaurant, and before we could eat our meal, before he could eat his sushi, I photographed it, because it looked like an alien creature to me. <laughs> So everywhere I looked, I was looking for alien creatures, even in museums. And this is one of my favorite fossils. In the Natural History Museum in Washington, D.C., you walk in and you see this fossil. It's one of the first segmented creatures that walked the Earth. It's over 380 million years old. Now, it's not very big. It's only about an inch. But here's the mystery. We looked at it, and it looked like it had spines, and it had little tentacles. And so for the longest time, we thought this is the way it walked in the water. And then we realized we'd made a big mistake. No, let's flip it upside down. It walks on the little tentacles, and those big spikes are sitting up there to protect it. So I took this little creature that lived 380 million years ago, and I made it into my own. It's big. It's over 15 feet tall. And I called it a temet. Now you're saying to yourself, I know you are. That's the stupidest name I ever heard for an alien. Well, I'll tell you what. It's not easy naming aliens. I had to pretend that I was in a space suit and I saw them for the first time and I would name them. So this was a temet because if you rearrange the letters to Emmet, that was my editor, Jennifer Emmett. <laughs> and sometimes her comments were pretty pointed. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, one of my biggest problems was I can draw and paint pretty well, but I knew I had to build my creatures. I wanted to make them with my hands. How many of you out here like to make things with your hands? How many of you have tried sculpture before? Ah, uh, you're the ones that I want to show this to because this is what I did. I had to learn how to do sculpture. I didn't know. So the first thing I did is I went to the library and got a bunch of books on how to do sculpture. And I read them forwards and back. And this was the one I really liked the most. So I went out and bought the clay that they recommended. This clay is non-toxic. You can mold it, shape it, and it'll stay soft for a long time until you put it in the oven at 200 degrees and bake it. Then it gets hard. Then you can sand it, you can scrape it, you can paint it, do anything you want with it. So I figured if I was going to have young readers make creatures, I was going to make it out of the materials they would, and I would make it the same way they would. So this is roughly how you do it. You take a roller, a, a broomstick handle, anything. And by the way, these instructions are in the book, much more detailed. Roll the clay out so it's really nice and thin. Take a piece of aluminum foil, scrunch it all up like this, and then pound it with something heavy so it stays with its shape. Then you turn around and start wrapping it with the clay and with your thumbs, blending it all in. Then you roll some other ones for legs and you roll them out. Then you attach them and look at that incredibly complex tool I'm using, a knitting needle. It works great. I made all my tools and I put the legs together on it, got some paint out and started to paint it, put it into a background, and there's my alien. And you can do that. I hope you do. And if you make some aliens, you better send me a picture of them. So I made some aliens that worked and some aliens that didn't. I made a lot of aliens that my art director said, uh-uh, not that one, and I made them over. So of all the aliens, that would be five times eight. What is that? What's five times eight? What's five times eight? Five times eight, Shayla. Forty, you're right. So I made over 40 aliens, but actually I probably made close to 60. Some of them just didn't make the cut. And these are some other funny things that I learned. I learned that while I was sculpting and put aliens together, that there were things in my past that really changed the way I looked at aliens. Things that I had done when I was younger, I could call upon again to inspire me to make these aliens. And this was one of them. I wanted to make something that looked like an amphibian, not a reptile. Reptiles have skin like suits of armor that hold all the moisture inside their body. But amphibians don't, like frogs, like salamanders. You always find them under a wet rock or in a, t a pool of water because their skin needs the water around them to stay wet. They lay their eggs in the water. So I wanted to make an upstanding amphibian creature. So I started out, and when I was looking at this, I remembered, aha! When I was a freshman in high school, I had to do a science project, and I had seen these crazy worms called planarians that if you cut their head down the center with a razor blade, I know that sounds really gross, but they don't feel it, two heads would grow back. Isn't that kind of weird? <laughs> so I decided to try it for my science project, and it worked. I ended up with a lot of two-headed flatworms. But to catch them, because I couldn't order them, I couldn't go to a pet store and buy them, my neighbors didn't have any, so what I did is I went to a creek. My dad drove me to a creek up in the mountains of California. We took some string, some kite string, and I tied big chunks of raw meat onto them, threw them into the water, because at night the little planarians will come up, they'll get onto the chunks of meat, and you pull them out, and there you have them. You take them in fresh water, and there's your little flatworms. So imagine the next morning we drove all the way back up into the mountains, and I start pulling my line out of the water, and boom, it gets stuck. It, get, it won't come out. It's heavy, and, it won't, and I pull harder and harder, and all of a sudden, this comes out. It's a strange creature called an axolotl. That's a Mexican name. It's about this big. It weighs about three pounds, and it's the ugliest thing you've ever seen. And look at the gills along the side of its head that are sticking out. So with this experience, years and years before, I wanted to recreate that axolotl look for an alien amphibian. And so I put it together, and then I said, how do I make the skin look like that? And I realized in Photoshop, 
you can take samples of textures and put them on skin. So one day when I was walking out, I photographed all the lichens on a tree trunk. I sampled them, put them on my creature, and there he is. And look at his gills up above. Just like the axolotl, I called him a green skin. So all of these things influenced me as I created my aliens. Sometimes I took plastic, styrene plastic. I would melt it over a candle, shape it, stretch it, pull it, glue all pieces together, put it together this way. And then when I painted it, the magic took place. I called them antlias. They're 12 feet tall. They're guards. And they guard the Buddha trees that are plants that live like animals. And it's a beautiful relationship. These are the guards that protect the Buddha tree. <laughs> the big bulbs you see are the fruit that the Buddha tree feeds to the antlias to keep them there. They work together hand in hand for survival on this alien world. And in their world, if you could take a peek through the jungle, it looks like this. Now, I had to go back and relearn biology to understand how aliens might look. And this is the, dis the interesting discovery I made. On planet Earth, how many of you are from Earth? OK. Some of you are a little undecided. We'll get back to you on that. <laughs> on Earth, we only find two major body types. One body type is called bilateral. The word bi means two. Any of you wear bifocals? Two glasses in one. The word means two. Bilateral means you can divide the body directly in half with two equal sides. Look around the room. Do you see any bilateral creatures here? <laughs> Look hard. Do you? Do you see one? Oh, it's on the board? <laughs> Does anybody else see a bilateral creature anywhere in this room? Point to a bilateral creature, either to yourself or to your neighbor, because we are bilaterals. We can be divided into two equal parts. So can butterflies, so can dogs, so can cats, so can birds, so can turtles. If we cut them in half once, the two parts would be equal. So a bi bilateral body is a pretty good shape. But there's radial shapes. There are creatures that you can cut them anyway, and they look the same. Starfish are one. Sea anemones are other ones. And they mostly live in the ocean. But my aliens could either have bilateral bodies or radial bodies. How many legs do you need? I don't know. Depends who you're talking to. <laughs> a lot of creatures have four legs that do quite well, thank you. Some of them have eight legs. Some of them have six legs. Some of them have 20 legs. Some of them have two legs. But none of them on Earth have three legs. So when I see somebody else's alien that looks like a bar stool, I know maybe not, because I have all the thousands and thousands and millions of creatures that have lived on Earth, not one of them had three legs. So none of my creatures have three legs. Senses. What senses could my creatures have? For instance, could it be like a bat? Could it send out pings in the darkness and see in the darkness with sonar radar as it sends out? Could some of my creatures have an electric feel around them, like these eels that live in these dark pools in South American jungles? They ping noise out left and right as they move through the water to see where they are. They're almost like the shields on the Starship Enterprise. And if you get too close to one, bam, it will zap you, and, and sometimes the fish around it kill them. That's how it hunts. It electrocutes them. And when two of these come together and they sense each other, they change their frequencies so they don't jam each other and they can pass by without affecting each other. Maybe some of my creatures will use electricity. Ooh, the honeybee. Here's the mystery about the honeybee that we don't know. It sees ultraviolet light. When it flies up to a plant, it looks like a landing runway when it comes in with the colors that we can't see. That's how the plants bring the honeybees in. They can see these landing lights as they come in on a flower. But it gets weirder. Our eyes can see things flicker at about anywhere from 18 to 24 frames per second. 
Our eyes can see things flicker until they're flickering at about 18 to 24 frames per second. So Hollywood shows us movies that go by at 30 frames per second and it all looks like a nice smooth movie. The early movies were slower and that's why when people went to the movies, where did they say they were going? To the flicks because the picture flickered on the stage because it wasn't moving fast enough. We can see up to about 40 flicks per second, at the most, usually about 30 human beings. Honeybees can see 250 flicks per second. In other words, if they looked at a movie, it would look like a very slow slideshow to them. They can see things we can't see. They could see an insect flapping its wings and they could see the wings go up and down and up and down and up and down. Imagine a creature that had eyes that could see flicks that fast and it used sign language, not like the guy at Mandela's funeral. They use a sign language to communicate with, but their hands are moving so fast we can't read it. It's a blur to us. And they're talking to us and talking to us. And they're saying to themselves, these are the stupidest creatures I ever met. I've been talking to them all day and they don't answer me back. Because it would be a very easy way to communicate all coming from the bumblebee. Snakes, they pick up odors on the side of their tongue. So they can pick up an odor over here and move towards it. An odor over there and move towards it. Cats and dogs and wolves and foxes have the most sensitive ears. Did you know, watch your cat sometime and a little sound and it turns its ear all the way around. Do you know what? You can walk within 40 feet of a cat and if you had one of those old time watches that went tick, 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 40 feet away it could hear it. We can't, but they can. And butterflies, hmm, what's so interesting about them? These things migrate from Canada all the way down to Mexico. They fly all the way down, and when they're done, they fly all the way back. They're not using their eyes to see. They're not using the stars to navigate with. What are they doing? There are little metal plates in their wings, and they are reading the magnetic fields of the Earth. Something we can't do, but aliens certainly could. Odor smells. We are so poor when it comes to smelling things. Sharks can pick up a drop of blood in Walden Pond. A drop of blood. And also what gets a shark going, it feels the vibrations of you swimming through the water. Imagine a creature that could sense you by your vibrations. You couldn't breathe in. Hold your breath. You couldn't breathe out. Hold your breath. You couldn't move. It could sense you and know right where you were. That would be a dangerous creature. And there's one of those on my world. Polyhemus moth can smell another moth, a female moth, seven miles away at night. Ants, they have a pheromone that they leave when they walk along the ground. It's a message that says, hey, I found something really tasty. Some kid dropped his ice cream on the ground. It's feast time. And they leave this odor trail and all the ants follow. When they've eaten it all up and they turn around and come home, they erase the scent. They don't put any more down and it disappears. Now, have you ever noticed sometimes when you see an ants on the ground and you accidentally crush one? or hit it with your magnifying glass. And all of a sudden, all the other ants start running around and running around. He's put out an emergency pheromone that says, danger, I'm in trouble. And all the other ants have heard it and smelled it. And all of a sudden, they go warrior on you and they're ready to defend and attack anything that gets near them because they smell that. Some ants will even creep into a different type of ant's house, leave a funny odor. They think they're being attacked. They attack themselves and then the other ants come in and take over. Imagine creatures that communicated with those odors. Your dog's nose is 10,000 times more sensitive than yours, and you feed him that dry dog food. <laughs> Look at these guys. Look at these salmon. They are born in a river, fresh water. They swim out into the ocean, and years later when they come back, they find that exact river. They go to the exact place where they were born. Not another river over here, not that one down there. They go to exactly the same one they were born in because the water smells good for them. Here's a dragus. I'm warning you right now, it's as big as a polar bear. 
And see that plate in the front? It picks up vibrations. It's faster than you. It can hear you breathing a hundred feet away. Hold your breath. Brains. Do we need brains? Do we? Do we respect brain, people with brains? Mm, sometimes I wonder. We have a central brain. It's a central brain that's located right up here in our head because our eyes report to it, our ears report to it, our nose reports to it, our mouth reports to it. It needs to know right away if it has to do something. So we have a centralized brain. There's a human, but there's no reason why you couldn't put that centralized brain in the middle of its chest. It would work just as well there, too. But we have other creatures that don't have any brains at all, or if they do, they are spread out and diffused, like sea urchins, uh, uh, sea anemones, and sand, and sand dollars. They don't have a central brain. They just have nerves that go through their body. It gets even stranger. There are colonial brains. We know that ants can communicate to each other with odors, but they can send messages back and forth. Termites are even stranger. We don't understand termites at all. Inside a termite mound, which they build themselves, it has to be kept within five degrees temperature. So when it starts getting really warm at the top, they open little doors down here in the bottom to bring the cool air in so it rises and cools it off. At night, they close the doors off up here and close the doors off down here to hold the warm air in. But do you know what? They can start opening those doors within one minute of the termites at the top knowing that it's too hot. They don't have cell phones. <laughs> they don't tweet. They don't send text messages. They have no way of communicating with each other, but they do because they share one colonial brain. Like the Borg in Star Trek, we could meet colonial brains in space. It gets better. Here's an octopus. See the eight arms on the octopus? There was a story that came out just a little while ago that changed the way we think about octopi. It has a brain in the center, a good brain, not particularly special, but now we realize every one of the arms has a brain. Every one of the arms acts like a separate creature. And while one arm may be digging a hole for the house, the other one is sent out to hunt for anything going by. This is a creature whose brain is spread throughout its body. And if you think that, and what's interesting about them is they're colorblind. And yet they can change to hundreds of different colors to match their environment. They can change the texture of their skin in a fraction of a second. We don't know what brain is telling it to do that. We don't know how that works. These are shape shifters, and you're looking at that octopus right there. You would swim right past it thinking it was a plant. Fish would swim past it thinking it was a plant. And the poor crab, on his way home from work, it'd been a long day, not paying any attention to the lights, will go right past it, and bang, the octopus has dinner. We don't know how it does it. And talking about brains, how many of you have ever thought your friend was a bird brain? <laughs> that would be a compliment. That would be a compliment because we have discovered for the first time birds and some fish can do something with their brains that we cannot. They have two separate sides to their brain and one of them can go to sleep while the other one stays awake. So sometimes when you see a baby duck by the side of the stream, watch it very closely. Its eyes are closed, and then all of a sudden this will happen. It's looking for predators, and then it'll close it again. The other side of the brain is sleeping. So next time, when you see geese flying over, heading south, they will be sleeping in the air. One half of them will be awake, one half of them will be sound asleep. And if you think that's amazing about brains, look at this guy. This is a flatworm. It's about three inches long. It's very colorful. It doesn't have a brain. There is no brain in its body. 
And yet, in a very short period of time, you can teach it how to go through a maze. You make a maze and you paint, paint part of it black and part of it white. And as you go through, if it goes into the black part, you give a little jolt of electricity from a battery, zzz, and it goes away from there, moves along, starts going into the black area, zzz, and it goes into the white. And very shortly, you can train it to go right through that maze in the white area. Now, isn't that amazing? Wait, I didn't tell you the best part. If one of these dies and you feed it to its friends who've never been in the maze, every one of them will know how to get through it. <laughs> so when we think about aliens in space, look at the aliens here for inspiration and what creatures on Earth can do. How many of you like plants? Plants just a plant, right? How many of you kill your house plants? You don't know. Well, guess what? Do you know plants can see you? Yeah, they can. Plants can see you. Plants can tell if you're standing next to them. They can tell if you're standing over them. They can tell if you're wearing a red shirt. They can tell if you're wearing a blue shirt. And guess what? They can even tell if you move them around to new locations in the house. They can tell if you've recently painted your house because the color has changed. Plants can smell other plants. There are some predatory plants that will attack tomato plants because they can smell the tomato plant and go after it. When a tree is having its fruit getting near ripe, if a tree over here, its fruit starts turning ripe sooner, it smells it, it knows it, it speeds up the process. They can even sense odors from insects eating other bushes. And when insects start eating another bush and they smell that smell, smell, some trees start producing a poison to protect themselves against the insects. They can smell. Trees know when you touch them. They do. Trees know when it's hot and when it's cold. And they'll, they'll react to areas. We think, well, come on, the wind blows on them. We see that a lot. But when you look at the Monterey Pines, they have responded to the constant winds. They don't grow big anymore. They stay small and compact. They are adjusting to the wind, to the touch of the wind on their leaves and on their trunks. So plants can feel touch. Luckily, they can't hear sound. So you can play any music you want to when your plants are in your room. Now, why am I telling all you this, and why did I take all this time in my life before I wrote this book? There's a very good reason. I also worked with the space program. This is my old aerospace company, Ball Aerospace. This is the Kepler spacecraft that we built. This is the spacecraft that has been discovering all the alien planets around alien worlds. What it's been doing is looking at stars, and as a planet moved in front of the star, you can see the light dipped just a little bit down here, and how big the planet was, it's how big the dip was. If it was a smaller planet, it would be shallower. How often this dip takes place tells us the orbit of the planet. And this is how we've been discovering planets out there. It's much like a floodlight if you put it outside. The big giant planets look like moths. They're easy to see when they fly in front of the light. But we don't care about those big planets. We want the little ones like Earth. And they're like a mosquito, and they're harder to find. But we are finding them. All right, enough of you. Thank you. We've also discovered that there are different types of Earth planets. Planets where life could exist. Planets like our own, we call them terrestrial planets, about 8,000 miles in diameter. But there now are super-Earths, twice the size of our Earth. We found a lot of super-Earths out there. We have found moon worlds that could be habitable around ice giant planets in a nice zone near the sun where our Earth is. So we know that we'll find moons that will have life on them. We'll find worlds that are covered with water. We'll find worlds that are frozen with ice. We'll find worlds that are desert worlds. And that's why I picked all these types of worlds to put alien creatures on them. And each one is adjusted to these worlds. This one will be hotter. This one will be colder. This one will have stronger gravity. I had to change all of that for my creatures that were on them. <laughs> one of the things that I learned that I did not know that surprised me is this. 
Planets change life. How many of you have seen Ice Age? The Earth was changing, wasn't it? The mastodons had to move on because the Earth was changing. So, planets can change the life that lives on them. Guess what? Life can change the planet, uh, the plants. Life can change planets. This is what the original life on Earth looked like something you would never recognize. The oceans on Earth were red, and there were these small little one-cell creatures that lived on the Earth. The air would poison you. We could not breathe it. It is carbon dioxide and methane. It's poisonous to us. But then something happened. Some of these little creatures evolved and changed, and they did something that nothing had ever done before. They took in sunlight for energy and power. They split the water into the hydrogen, and they used it for fuel. And the oxygen, ah, oh, they didn't want the oxygen. That's a waste product. And they got rid of it into the atmosphere. And guess what? That oxygen was poison to these first creatures, and they all died. But because of these creatures putting oxygen into the atmosphere, our planet now looked like this. So animal life, plant life can change a planet. This is what the oxygen content looked like over history. One billion years ago, it started to grow. Then it took off 500 million years ago. Wow, at 20% today, this is what we need to survive. So plants provided all the oxygen we breathe on this planet. So when we look at alien planets, we're going to look for oxygen in the atmosphere. Next time you take a breath, say thank you, plants. You can do it. We also know that the life of planets have a limited lifetime. Planets do not live forever. Another 500 million years, things are going to start changing here on the Earth. We are the golden age of life on Earth. So life is even limited by the age of their planets. We also know that the first wave of life on the universe was based on biology. We're based on biology. Everything we see on this planet is based on biology. But a hundred years from now, we could say something different here on Earth. The second wave of life in the universe will be based on artificial life, robotics, artificial intelligence. And we believe right now, somewhere out there among the stars, artificial life already exists. The second wave of life in the universe has begun. So these were all the things I studied to create these beautiful creatures like little sea pups. This remind you of anything? That slug going across my patio? Look at these beautiful worlds. Creatures that communicate with odors, they don't talk. The butterflies of this world. Strange, beautiful creatures that we cannot even imagine what they are, what they see. These are all the planets we know of today, over 3,000. I picked one sun to put in the center, and all these are real planets that we have mapped and made lists of. Some of them are Earth-like planets. This list grows every day. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger as we discover all of these new alien worlds out there. Any one of those could be a planet Earth. Any one of them could have life on them. <coughs> and as the discoveries come in, as I saw these new planets being discovered, I realized something. I realized something that I never thought would happen. There are worlds out there a little bit hotter than Earth, covered by clouds, steamy clouds, worlds that are beautiful but different than our own, populated by creatures in space. 
There are frozen worlds out there with life living on them in shapes and forms that we can't even begin to imagine. And underneath them, more than likely, oceans. There are worlds that have lost their sun, rogue planets traveling through space alone, and yet there could be life on those too. Remnants of an earlier time when it circled the sun and its sky. And there will be beautiful water-covered worlds with creatures swimming in the oceans. Oceans unimaginable to us. There will be baby worlds just being born with the first life appearing on them. The dust ring and material still hasn't cleared out from their early solar system. There will be worlds with not one, not two, but three suns in their sky to illuminate their daytime. And there will be Earth worlds out there, worlds that we would mistake for our own planet, worlds with continents and oceans and rivers and lakes and clouds and storms and rain and maybe life that's intelligent enough to communicate with us. They do exist out there and it's just a matter of time before we find them. In the year 2022, the Giant Magellan Telescope will begin operation. It is the biggest telescope ever made by human beings. It dwarfs anything we've ever built before. We'll see the universe 10 times more clearly than Hubble showed it to us. And what this telescope will do that no other telescope has ever done is it will show us Earth-like planets. And we'll be able to look at its atmosphere to see if there's oxygen and to see if there's life on these planets. So that's why I wrote this book for you. All the young people out there with imaginations that are going to grow up and do wonderful things, I can tell you right now in your lifetime, within the next 20 years, you will know something no human has ever known before. You will know where there is life in the universe and on what planets it exists. That's the knowledge you will have. That's what you will know. So take my book with you, pull it out when we've discovered life in the universe, and either laugh or say, this is the coolest book I ever read. <laughs> because I guarantee you this, my last thought. Somewhere, something incredible awaits us out there. That somewhere is on a distant alien world. Thank you. I think we got to have time for a couple of questions. This young lady's arm was going up and down and up and down. Anybody have a question? Yes. Do you know what? I don't know if we've found any yet that move in figure eights. They certainly could. Boy, that would really make weather and seasons odd on them. And one of my planets instead of, you know, the Earth goes around the Sun like this, 
it goes around like this, like somebody stepped on a hula hoop. Wait till you see how weird the weather is on that planet. Yes? How did fish life get created? How did what? Fish life get created. Fish life was created from the first life in the oceans. One of the things I learned at WGBH when I worked on the evolution program, when I came in and I interviewed for the position, I was quizzed by the director, and he said, David, I have one question for you. You get this right, I'm hiring you. I said, uh-uh. He said, what's the most amazing thing about life on Earth? Okay, I started thinking back about all the girls I dated in high school, but that probably didn't count. <laughs> and this is it. Everything that we see on Earth, everything from plants to birds to fish to dolphins to humans started as one life form. And as the environment of the Earth changed, as this life form moved into different areas, it changed. It evolved into something else, into something else, into something else. And that's where everything came from. Everything around us, everything that we know, started from one, the first life form that went from being inorganic chemicals to something that came together and said, hey, I exist. Don't poke me. I'm hungry. I wonder what my friends are doing tonight. That's how it started. So fish started on that long chain. Fish came before we did. We're latecomers. We're really late. We missed the party for years. <laughs> Question back here. Yes. This is a good question. I've had that before, and we have gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn that we can't walk on. They're just slushy uh, methane, ices, and snows. There's no surface to walk on them. And I've been asked before, well, could there be really weird, incredible life on those planets? And the answer is maybe, but what I did is I wanted to look at all the life that we find here on Earth. And we have slushy piles, that methane gas, and nothing lives in them. Or if it does, it's tiny bacteria. Nothing you could sell your car to <laughs> or buy a telescope from. So I eliminated them right away. I wanted to take Earth environments to the extremes to see how a life might change and live on those worlds. And it would be nice. You could have electric creatures. You could have floating body creatures. You could have all sorts of things. But that would be even more science fiction than I wanted to go, because I wanted to use biology, botany, geology, all of the different sciences that we use to see how strange life could be based on what we see here on Earth. And you got to admit it, some of those kids you go to school with, they're pretty strange. <laughs> yes? Book. Yeah. Um, that slug. How did you get the scale looking thing on the slug? How did I get that? I painted it. I painted that. I created that slug. I used my mouse and I moved it around and I painted. And all of those scales I textured from rocks. Rocks near a volcano I had seen on a vacation. So I used those to texture because the skin would work really well because that poor guy lives on a world that is freezing cold. So he has to have an armored skin. Question, poor slug. What would happen if you tried to land on Jupiter? You'd sink right through it. The, what would happen if you tried to land on Jupiter? You'd sink right through it. If gravity is so strong, it would accelerate your spacecraft. You probably couldn't pull out. You'd crash and you'd say, why did I want to do that? <laughs> what was I thinking? Yeah. Um, is it possible um, to be life on the sun? Is it possible for life on the sun? Well, maybe if you go there at nighttime. <laughs> no. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> Too hot. Too hot. As little comet Ison found out about three weeks ago. Little Comet Ison, a big rock, a mile in diameter, got too close to the sun and whoop, it never showed up for work on Monday. It was gone. The sun ate it. Burn it up.
Yes. Um, what made the oceans red? Like, what made the oceans red? The creatures that were living in it, taking the chemicals out of the atmosphere, were red. They made the water red. There were so many of them. These are one-celled, tiny little things you need a microscope to see. But there's so many of them. You know what? Any of you have a swimming pool? Any of you have forgotten to clean it? What color does it turn? Green. Last thing you want to see two hours before a party. I got a green swimming pool. Because those are all little one-cell green plants that have bloomed in the swimming pool, just like they did in the ocean, but they were red. We get red tides sometimes here in Rhode Island, where all the water turns red. It's from the little phytoplankton, the little red algae that's in the water. They reproduce very fast. And that's what the oceans look like. You'd come to Earth, if you were in your spaceship, you'd say, hey, there's something wrong here. And I thought this was the blue planet. It's the red planet. And you'd keep moving thinking you'd missed it. All right, we'll take one more question. Way in the back, that arm waving back there in a big voice. Um, how can there be intelligent life in another planet? Well, how can there be intelligent life on another planet? And I know why you're asking that, because certainly you've been thinking lately about Congress. <laughs> it's a, it's reasonable, but... To be honest, we don't know what intelligence is. We think intelligence is an awareness of self, ourselves, an awareness that our lives may end, an awareness that we need to relate to other people, an awareness that we don't like it when somebody pokes us. But we don't really know what intelligence is. And what we're afraid of is that our intelligence, all of us in this room, the way we sense our planet, our universe, and things around it are the senses that we have developed here that send us information. For instance, if a person could not smell, they might think a little bit differently of the earth and, and everything around them. Or if they could not hear, they might think a little bit differently about it. But imagine aliens who are aware of themselves who are intelligent but have entirely different senses. The universe would be entirely different to them. We might never be able to communicate with them. We might never find anything in common with them. So that's why when I see a science fiction movie, the aliens come down, they walk on two legs with two arms with bumps on their nose and pointy ears, and they shoot us with ray guns. I'm not so sure that's what alien life looks like. And that's why I purposefully did not put that type of alien life in my book. We're an oddity. We are rare. And if an asteroid had not hit the Earth 65 million years ago, more than likely, we would not be here. This would be still the land of dinosaurs. We would not have had our chance when the dinosaurs were eliminated to take over and become who we are. So. What is intelligence? I don't know. I, but that's a very intriguing question. If you get the answer to it, please let me know. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining me. If you'd like to buy a book, I'd be happy to sign them.